Coming up with more QB visits well underway, is Big Blue actually looking at taking a top flight talent in the NFL draft? We dive in on that, plus assuming that it is wide receiver at the sixth overall pick. What happens in the second round? What happens in the third round? Cornerbacks, running backs, it's all on the table as we try to give you the perfect path through the draft. All coming up next. Ah, yes, my friends, it is OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your host over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. We are healthy, we are wealthy, and we certainly are wise. That is because as we dive in on not only some news and notes around visits and the, the draft is starting to build up here, but picks, players that we believe can help this team, we let you know today's episode will be brought to you by Personum, which is an AI-driven cyber threat detection engine. Personum improves your vision into your network security environment and allows you to see cyber threats that other tools and platforms just can't do. Personum is always vigilant, always learning. And Andy, are we always vigilant and learning? Do you feel do you feel like as we approach the draft and all these visits and all this nonsense and everybody and the rumors, are we improving? Are we being vigilant to the information available to us? We absolutely are. Oh, we're always learning. You know what I learned, Adam? I learned that there are OGP fans in Las Vegas. Last week on my on my flight back, someone came That's up right. and said, love the podcast, love what you guys are doing. I was like, you talking to me? Me and me and 9C? Is that what you're talking about? So shout out to that kind gentleman who was on the flight from Las Vegas to Newark Airport last yes. Thursday. Shouting out OGP. He said, keep doing, keep doing, keep fighting the good fight. And he said he does not think the Giants are taking a quarterback at six. Just going to let you know. Well, yeah, and I thought, you know, just to round out this story, I thought it was a little bit, mm, I'm going to say big wig of you to say, oh, can I get an extra bag of peanuts, please? Thanks so much. I mean, he's a fan. He's there to compliment you, to compliment the show, and you go asking for a beverage. He did say no quarterback for the Giants. So we will get to that because that's really the bulk of what we're focusing on here. However, Andy, for a man like yourself, and I'm sure you were wearing the tinfoil hat while you were on the flight just to greet all of those fine fans of ours around there. Dan Duggan at the end of last week said, impossible to know if the Giants will draft a QB. They need to fall in love with a QB that will be available for them. But we can at least dismiss the notion that their QB interest is a, quote, smokescreen. Time is too valuable to travel around the country in a misdirection attempt. This off of Pat Leonard, who was just covering where the, where the Giants were headed, right? They've basically seen every single top quarterback. They're also seeing Penix. So they're doing all these visits. Brian Dable, Joe Shane, and I say to you, Andy, finally, you can acknowledge that the Giants are legitimately interested in taking a quarterback potentially at the top of the draft. You clearly don't know me then. You clearly don't know that I'm not taking this tinfoil hat off, Adam. Like, I, listen, I've been on this thing since the beginning. I think, obviously, you let out what you want to get out, and obviously the Giants did go to the LSU Pro Day. Everyone says they were they were looking at Jaden Daniels, watching him throw the football. May I remind you that he was throwing the football to Malik Neighbors, right? When sure. when we talk about Washington's pro day, they're looking at Michael Penix. Like, could Roma Dunze be the guy that they were actually scouting, thinking maybe that's the guy that we want? And, you know, the other thing that everyone's saying, well, is Andy, like, clearly they're in the market if they're going to the USC pro day and they're watching Caleb Williams. Like, why else would you go there? And just may I, may I remind you, though, like, you don't want to be the one GM that doesn't go watch the pro day for this guy. And all of a sudden he ends up being the next Patrick Mahomes. Like if you're in the market at all, or there's a question about your quarterback position, you have to go do these things. And also may I remind you that the running back, Marshawn Lloyd is there. Brennan Rice is the wide receiver ranked, you know, early third round type of type of pick. Sure. There are other players at these pro days other than just the quarterback. So for me, Adam, I'm not really reading into it. Like, well, clearly the giants are interested in one of these top three quarterbacks. The biggest one there is actually probably the USC one where you're like, listen, Caleb Williams, it's all consensus. He's going number one. And, and it is this idea, too, I think, that pro days, hey, like other players perform at pro days. Right. Like it's not just the, you know, just these quarterbacks that are putting it on there. And if you're if you're smart about it, hey, I get to see a lot of players, right? Maybe I'm actually looking at some of the mid round players that are there just catching passes from a quarterback or, you know, not necessarily even really showcasing themselves per se. So 
I, listen, I'm fine with it. I don't think that it's funny because there's so many high top wide receivers at these schools as well. It makes it impossible to be like, well, they're obviously going purely for quarterback here. Uh, respect to Dan Duggan, you know, for maybe taking taking the little the little crumb and saying, hey, I'll throw it back out. It's not a bad mark on my record if I pass along what feels like to be perceived information. I, I, I do think that the Giants are willing to if the right quarterback is there for them at six, I think they're willing to do that. Maybe that's only JJ McCarthy from a realistic perspective, but now he's getting talked about. Maybe it's Washington, right? Second overall. Some people have actually accidentally verbalized that out loud. So we have to see how it unfolds here. We'll talk more about quarterbacks down the line in terms of what if one of these players were to fall there, but then it's the other side of it, right? Getting the elite number one weapon. And you and I have been on this for a long time. It's, this is what you not you know need to do. Maybe feels a little bit you know of an overstatement, but it certainly fills the need that this franchise has lacked for a number of seasons, and they've lacked it at a number of positions. When we look at the top of this draft, and we understand Marvin Harrison Jr., we understand Malik Neighbors, we understand Rome uh, Adunze there as well. Do you feel like when you come up at the sixth overall pick that you have to do it based on even looking at the rest of the wide receiver class. Because as I've gone back, we've talked about uh, Tom, you know Thomas before, also at L LSU. You can talk about Mitchell out of Texas. It's hard to even think about, quote, waiting to get that need filled at the 47th overall pick. As deep as this wide receiver class is, there seems like a lot of chatter just pulling more and more bodies up towards that first round. Yeah, well, that's the thing that I struggle with most, Adam, and why I personally – would like to see the Giants draft a wide receiver at six if they stay there is because the Giants are not in the same position as, say, Buffalo or, say, Dallas. And you may say, yeah, because they have a quarterback. Yes, I get that. I understand that they believe that they have. Well, a lot of teams got a lot of stuff the Giants don't have. Yeah, here, here, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, we, we, we're we picking six for a reason in this, in this upcoming draft, Adam. But the thing that they have that the Giants don't is a bona fide number one wide receiver. Obviously, Buffalo has someone like Stephon Diggs. Obviously, Dallas has CeeDee Lamb. The Giants are looking to fill the wide receiver one position, the alpha, the guy you go to when everything else breaks down. What you can't do is just assume that you can get a guy late second round or in the third round and just immediately put the pressure of being the wide receiver one on him in an offense designed almost around his skill set. So for me, it's much trickier for the Giants where it feels like you have to get a top line wide receiver Whereas some of these other uh, other teams are looking at it saying, hey, a Xavier Leggett, hey, uh, Ricky Purcell, these are guys that are really interesting prospects that have good athleticism, showed really good tape, and that they could be a complimentary number two and maybe learn their way into being more of an impact player. Yeah, of course. And that's, I think, you know, when we get into discussing cornerbacks, second and third round picks here and what the Giants want to fill, the needs they need to address, it's hard to look at wide receiver and it's hard to look at it because these top three guys seem to be so elite and what feels like can't miss opportunities, obviously. But even as you work your way back, like originally, Leggett, as you mentioned there, this is a 9.92 Raz score player prospect who has every every single measurable that you would love about him. Now, originally, you're talking about, could he be there at 47? Is he a little bit behind that? Now it feels like he's getting closer to the top of the second round. You know, we always remember that obviously you can't just have every best player go one through 32 and then have no great player options still available. Guys are going to fall. But he was a guy that originally I thought, oh, well, he'll be there for the Giants. What a good steal that could be at 47 if you go a different route at sixth overall. But now he might be gone, right? McConkey out of Georgia, is he there and does he really fit? That's the other part of this. Fit and need. You already have Wandale Robinson. You already have Jalen Hyatt preparing for the exit potentially after this season of Darius Slayton becomes a little more interesting here too. Like there could be multiple holes for the wide receiver room, but I have a hard time. Like if you're talking about waiting on it, then you have to make the, the call about is Troy Franklin going to be out of the first round in the second round. And how far back could he go third round picks and get to Keon Coleman and some of these other names, Xavier, uh, sorry, uh, worthy out of Texas, who was the big pro day uh, scouting combine darling with his 40 time D has the shine worn off of him. Could he be there for you? And even if you do, when you go and read up on these guys, there's always two or three you know, drawbacks or flaws, whereas so much about what we see at the top of the draft is essentially a can't-miss target that only needs to refine their skill set, not develop another aspect of their game. 
Yeah, you look at the top three when we talk about Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, and Malik Neighbors, they clearly have separated themselves into a different category where they have all the combinations of size, speed, production, aggressiveness, like all of those things. You look at it and you kind of check the box and say, any of those three can pretty much do those things. With some of the other wide receivers, as you mentioned, you may say, well, he's really great at this, but we didn't see the lack, of, we didn't see the, the production that we would expect during the regular season. Or we saw all this production, but his measurables and his speed really aren't there to be able to get by NFL, you know, NFL made cornerbacks. So really you're taking the risk in the second or third round. To me right now, that's why I want to lock in that number one wide receiver to give that offense a real solid chance and then focus your attention on other areas of need in the second and third round. Yeah, and that's also too because say say you had a plan in your mind if you're Joe Shane, we're not going to go with wide receiver. Maybe it ends up being quarterback, right? Or maybe it ends up that you trade back a couple spots, whatever the case. And then as the second round approaches, you all of a sudden go, oh, shoot. You know, th there was a little bit of a run here on wide receivers at the back end of the first round, or we wanted to trade up a few spots, but we weren't able to do it. Well, now you're talking about trying to get a wide receiver at 70. And now you're just talking about, okay, like we, we can build this thing a different way, but there's no way that when we talk about building those draft boards out and every GM and organization has the multiple paths, well, if we do X, then Y, right? Here's our number one option. If that were the case, and you're talking about picking at 70 and looking at wide receivers, there's a world where you're like, well, that was path number four, maybe for us, you know, that we were actually willing to go down to try to improve our team. Go ahead. And you hope, you hope, it, it, we gave away, our own second round pick in the trade with Brian Burns. You're talking about the Seattle right. pick that we have. You have to wait longer in the second round. What if all of a sudden there's a run on these wide receivers early in the second round and the Giants are sitting there saying, well, our plan B is now turning into a plan C because four wide receivers just went in a row before us, a la what happened when the Giants took Deontay Banks last year. So that that's the reality is the further you are picking away in the second round, the less control you feel like you have of what you want to do. And if the Giants go go uh, and skip on a wide receiver in the first round, then all of a sudden there's a run in the second round. You're sitting there saying, like, we still have this glaring hole and we did not fill it, and now maybe we're even reaching for a player that's a third or fourth round right. you know, uh, pro projected prospect that you need to figure things out with. That is the route I don't want the Giants to go down. 100%. That's why coming up here in a second, let's talk about pick 47. Let's talk about pick 70. The wide receiver has been taken for Big Blue at the sixth overall spot. It is Roma Dunze as far as OGP is concerned. How do they go ahead and continue to build out this roster successfully with the way the board currently stands? We'll get into that in just one moment. All right. So as we talk about then, we're taking the wide receiver. We're moving to the second round. We've got pick 47. As you mentioned, we don't have that extra pick that would have been nice to kind of play with a little bit. Now it's about what is the preference here? I think we're both in agreement that when you look at this roster, barring something happening here in free agency, which to this point it hasn't, and we don't think that any, anything that they do now is going to preclude them from making a decision on draft day. Cornerback just seems to be the very obvious direction that the Giants need to go here to pair somebody with Deontay Banks. You get there at 47. Who is your guy with the 47th overall pick that you believe can fill that need and really be successful, as we know, hitting the ground running day one? Because there isn't anybody else ahead of him to let him feather himself in and get used to the NFL. Yeah. So, Adam, obviously there's a bunch of uh, early first round, mid first round cornerbacks that are probably going to go earlier. So you have to think about um, the types of players that may be available to the Giants. As at, you know, as I remind you, picking 47, you're not picking that early in the first round. It's kind of a mid uh, uh, early second round. It's kind of a mid second round pick. So I've kind of been doing some studying and looking at Kamari Lassiter the cornerback from the University of Georgia. He is yep. six feet tall, 180 pounds. He's got great athleticism. Now, the knock on him, uh, I'll start with the cons. The knock on him is that he may not have that top line breakaway speed, Adam. Like, you know, right. if you get a Tyree kill next to him, he's going to get beat, um, you know, pretty significantly. In man-to-man -man coverage, you can see sometimes he really is just face guarding the man and not really looking back at the ball, so he's not really making a play. And so you may say, well, Andy, like that doesn't sound good. He doesn't have speed and it's not great in man-to-man -man <laughs> coverage. Why are, you, why, are you, why are you interested in him for a second round pick? And the positives about Lassiter are he is great in his own scheme, Adam. He is really instinctual about where the ball is going to be, where the player is going to be, and reacting off of that. And wouldn't you know it, Bowen runs a zone-heavy scheme for the Giants, which like suits his skill set to a T when you're talking about the cornerback position. In addition to that, Adam, 
like, you know, we talk about not having that top line breakaway speed. Sometimes you don't need that because Kamari Lasseter's three cone drill of 6.62 seconds is the fastest time of any player at the NFL combine. So like when you think about his agility and shiftiness, like in small spaces, he is super athletic. And that's why him being able to sit back in Shane Bowen's, you know, zone scheme and being able to use his intelligence and short agility bursts. To me, that screams out a perfect pairing alongside Deontay Banks on the other side of the field. And it really addresses a need that the Giants desperately have right now. I do like it. And I think you say there's a four, six, five, 40, right? So you're worrying about that over the top. And the one thing that that brings up is for the Giants, you'd say, you know, if you're thinking about the NFL now, they're running more of those two high shell at the safety position. So you have that help over the top and it mitigates a little bit of that. But you got to look inside the safety room and say, how confident are we in the safety room that we currently have? Maybe the Giants are going to address, address it in the draft. But as we're laying it out here, wide receiver round one, cornerback round two. We'll talk about round three. If you're not drafting a safety until the fourth round, where's the expectation bar for them? Now, I, I do think that the Shane Bowen defensive scheme and how it's going to shift things here, I do find that really interesting because I actually think it's going to make life easier on certain positions for this defense, right? And we think the defensive front is getting stronger. So there's going to be like a really different kind of shift here away from Wink Martindale, the blitz heavy scheme, all the pressure where I think a lot of that on the back end is like kind of boom or bust, right? Either you hold up for the three seconds that you need to, or maybe you're getting beat over the top. The one thing I'll bring up here before we, before we talk um, more prospects and then more scheme stuff here too, is I just want, I wanted to read this. A quality draft prospect who has ideal size is a dominant run defender as well as an outstanding tackler combined with elite speed and agility. He is also excellent as a short-range press corner who dominates smaller receivers and easily holds up against larger tight ends. Overall, this prospect will be viewed as a corner with outstanding traits and a potential who does most things pretty well, which gives him some versatility coming into the NFL, currently expecting to be a high second-round selection. That's Deontay Banks going back to last year's draft class where you're talking about what you have the expectations for for a player that the Giants drafted, brought in to be a number one starting corner. And from a measurable standpoint, listen, he was six six foot. That's 63rd percentile for the position. 197 pounds. That's 68th percentile per, for the position. All of his measurables, 4, 3, 5, 40, doesn't hurt anybody here, right? The vertical, the broad, like, it's funny how when you go back and look at him, if you only read the sheet, you'd say, oh, it, you know, this is everything you need to be. But he's just big enough, just physical enough, fast as all get out to be able to put together this combination of player. And I, I bring up that description because when you go look at these prospects in the second round for the end of, for the draft this season, it, it's hard to find that convergence of talent that makes you feel like even if they need some refinement, they can get there for you because that size piece for Deontay Banks is such a big difference at the NFL level, being able to hold up physically in those matchups. Yeah, I agree. And that's why Kamari Lasseter is six foot tall. He is yep. like that, that, that sizey range. He's type 186. Of, I mean, you know, he, he's right there, you know, five, five, seven pounds, you know, over the course of training camp going towards the regular season, he's got the physicality, the speed is probably right. That's what we're talking about here in terms of matchups. Yeah. The, the only challenge I have with, with Lasseter is actually, you know, NFL draft buzz has him as their 41st ranked player the Giants are yeah. sitting there at 47 is he really going to fall it you know it, it's going to be a little dicey for the Giants to make that move but if you're telling me that in round one you can address the wide receiver room and then in round two get a player that can basically start has versatility to play in nickel coverage as well as inside outside so that type of, of player to me is tremendously valuable in an area of need for the Giants Okay, I'm going to give you two quick names here at this position before we get over to the 70th overall pick and what the Giants can do here, where we'll probably divide in terms of positions that we'll address, although the names may be familiar. Uh, DJ James for me, who right now by draft buzz standards says late second round. I think there's some, some opportunity for him to move a little bit. Now, just six foot and the key issue here, 175 pounds, right? So 20 pounds lighter than Deontay Banks coming in at the exact same height, but Run, uh, he has uh, coverage 99 percentile, uh, zone 95th percentile, man press 96 percentile. If you go and look at the write up on him, the only thing holding him back, in addition to just being a college prospect and obviously has to continue to refine what he is as a player at the NFL level, 
It's just the question about can he hold up physically at 175 pounds? Will he get beat up coming off the line? Will it be hard for him to get up against some of those more difficult matchups? If you're talking about maybe a speed player across from you and Deontay Banks picking up that assignment more often than not. There's something here with him where I look at his look at all of his profile and traits and say, listen, this is a guy that runs a 442. He has every single element to walk in the door day one from a technique standpoint and execute. It's just whether or not he'll be able to hold up, like whether or not he can be big enough. And it's not like, say, as you mentioned, Lasseter, hey, put on five to seven pounds. This is put on like 10 to 15 pounds and then still be able to play with fluidity and speed and quickness. So I mentioned him there briefly. And then the other one is just local product, Max Melton. I feel like he's not getting as much respect as he deserves around where his draft stock should be. Ran a 439 at the combine, 511, buck 87. This is a guy that kind of fits this profile here as well. He gets currently listed as a third round prospect. But as we say, mid round picks, you don't get the luxury of saying, well, we'll see what happens. I don't know if the Giants would have enough of a conviction about a player that's third round, even early third round label to go that high. But he's another player that I like to watch and have been trying to look at more tape on him. Sometimes hard with certain schools finding high level matchups to be able to get quality tape against the highest level of competition. Yeah. I mean, the DJ James thing is interesting, but you pointed out, Adam, like his, his slight build. If you're worried about yep. Kamari Lasseter being a little bit of a slight build, like imagine him trying to hold up against big physical wide receivers, like a Keenan Allen or a DK, DK Metcalf, like that, those create challenges for me. He he's an, you know, DJ James is an aggressive tackler, but like in the run game, even like his ability to step up and make plays in the run game might be a challenge. So I, I, I like him in coverage. I just think, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with a second round pick, there's obviously reasons why they're not a first round pick. And those are the things on DJ James that, that concern me just a little bit. And then you say like, you know, and it's funny too, you look at the, okay. And run defense and, and I get it. You, you want your players to be the both end, right? You want that element. But at some point, as you say, we're picking 47th in the second round. If I'm going to look at these, pro like, hey, do the first thing first, right? Be be a cornerback, be a coverage player, be a guy that can break up passes. Playmaking is something else, I think, at any of these prospects, right? I think it's Lasseter that they mentioned about needs to be a little bit better in ball production in terms of forcing some turnovers, being in a good position, but then not converting. You know, when I read those things, on the one hand, I say, oh, well, yeah, you want turnovers. The other side is I'm like, well, if he's in the right position and he's breaking up the pass, like what, you know, let's start with the first At thing first. Point, See what the receiver. Get lucky right. and, it, and it'll end up finding the ball will find him. Like if you put yourself in a good enough position more often than not, it's going to work out for you. I feel the same way. Like right. some of it's a little bit of luck. Some of it's like circumstance to me. If you're in the right spot doing the right things, eventually good uh, other good things will happen to you. So we're going to turn our attention over to the third round pick 70th overall. Don't worry uh, when we talk about some players out there like TJ Tampa. Yes, we know that that guy is in this room as well. We got a long way to go between now and the draft. So we're going to continue to break down other cornerbacks, including ones that get into that third and fourth round potentially because I have, there's, a, there's a whole list. I'll tease you with it at the end. There's a whole list of guys that I find very intriguing. But for now, let's talk pick number 70 coming up here in just one second. Okay, so we are Joe Shane. We have taken Roma Dunze at the sixth overall pick at 47. Whoever it ends up being, did Lasseter fall to us? Maybe it is TJ Tampa. Any of those players, we're trying to address cornerback because we know how paramount it is. Now we're there. 70th overall pick. Third round pick, Andy. Third round pick for a man who notoriously devalues the position. You apparently have a name on your list that you think the Giants should go after. Yes. So there are certain positions and I felt this way for a while, like center was kind of one of them where you can't take a center in the first round. Like the positional value isn't there based on contracts and all the, all these other things. But I do think that the third round for the giants based on, on how the team is right now is right to bring in another explosive playmaker on the offensive side of the ball. And to me mm -hmm. that screams Jalen Wright of Tennessee. I, he was obviously one of the darlings of, of the NFL combine. 5'10", 210 pounds, so he's a little bit of a, of a, of a bigger running back. But the, the size isn't the thing, Adam. It is the speed. Like a, a 4 3 yeah. eight, 40, and the fastest five-yard acceleration of any running back in the last two combines, the guy is just like – his explosiveness just oozes off the screen. When you see him run or you see him move, you're like, this guy is a home run hitter. He is absolutely one of those guys that can take it to the house anytime he touches it. And so, you know, 
relative athletic score is something that is used at the NFL combine, Adam. It just talks about like when you talk about size and speed and athleticism and burst and things like that, it, it compilates all of them together. And we've used the RAS score before, you know, Jalen Wright's yep. RAS, RAS score is 9.82, which is unbelievable. And if you think about it, it would rank 33rd out of the 1700 plus running backs that have been measured since 1987. So you're talking about in the last like 30 something years, he ranks as the 33rd most athletic running back to ever come out. And Adam, the reason why I think it's also important is we have Devin, Devin Singletary locked in as kind of the first down back. We'll go get you some yards. Jalen Wright really improved in the pass catching game last season. He had more catches out of the backfield than his previous two seasons combined. He gets the ball in his hands and he makes plays. And so he projects as kind of a change of pace back, home run hitter, get the ball in his hands, get him out of the backfield. It feels like that's the type of weapon that can be utilized in a Kafka Dable system, especially knowing that this offense lacks talent right now and explosiveness. Of course. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I don't knock. It's funny because we, we talked about mentioning names along the way of, of course, his off season. Jalen Wright. It's like when you look at it, everything you say, you're like, this guy's just electric. Why wouldn't you want him? And then you think about the needs of the team in the in the long term. This is where I think like investing in, say, Jalen Wright, the 70th overall pick makes sense because in the long term. Right. OK. Singletary is a nice piece and you brought him in. You're trying to form this stopgap, but he's not going to be here for three, four five years. What is it going to look like another year from now? Right. So bringing in a player like that makes a lot of sense. And the pass catching part of it makes a lot of sense, too, because we're talking about adding weapons. So every time when we say, well, you go get a wide receiver at the top of the draft, that's great. Now, what's the next step? Tight end has become weird because the Giants added in so many bodies this offseason. None of them are, are perfect. Darren Waller is still maybe retiring. So you're in this ambiguous space. And I, I, I find it harder and harder to see them going tight end anywhere before, say, the fourth round. And, and that'd be at best. But you still need weapons, right? Like you still need more weapons. And having a pass catching dual threat back out of the backfield makes all the sense in the world to me. If I was looking, I won't even I'll, I'll go away from it because there's some other running backs that we'll talk about. Over the course of this, obviously, if you're thinking about beyond him, oh, listen, I had mentioned Allen before out of Wisconsin. That's going to be a later. You can move maybe, you know, another round down here, obviously, and still go get a player like that. The question is, like, he's a big physical back. Does he play big and physical enough? You've mentioned Corum before. Irving has come up like there are players that we can talk about. Will Shipley has been a really interesting name. That's hard to kind of peg down where he sits inside of NFL draft boards. But if I looked at the draft overall. The intriguing thing to me is probably offensive line because starting at like 60, 61, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven prospects in that 60 to 72 ish kind of range for offensive linemen. Now, on the one hand, the Giants made plenty of moves, just like tight end brought in players. Though my question is, where is the belief in the young talent that you spent draft capital on before? And where are we going to be a year from now? A Dunze, right? McKathan, even if you even think about what's going to happen at the center position, we believe in him, but there, there's this little you know lump in the throat of concern behind Evan Neal in the long term, all these things, right? I wonder if value changes this. I'm not even saying I would go offensive line, but I think maybe we've gotten a little bit away from that position because they brought in free agents. You still got to be prepared for the future. Like you still need to be prepared for two years down the line here. And I just wonder if value will fall there when we hear the way wide receiver gets talked about some secondary players, right? There's a lot of talent here and all of a sudden a, you know, top 50 prospect has fallen to 70 and it's hard to get away from a little bit. Yeah. You know, that is a really good call out. Cause you just assume that they sign a Luminor, they sign uh John Runyon jr. You're like, okay, they've really uh, uh, addressed the offensive line. But the big elephant in the room is what happens if things don't work out with Evan Neal, right? Like if he is right. not the guy at right tackle, and a lot of places already have Illuminor uh, ranked as the starting right tackle. Right. Yeah. Um, you have Aaron Stinney at left guard who signed like a, a minimum type deal. You have Joshua Zudu, Marcus McCaithin. We don't really know what we're getting out of any of those picks. They feel like a huge question mark. So being able to either go up and get a tackle as insurance for Evan Neal or a guard to either replace Stinney or move over and kick Illuminor out to the right tackle position is something the Giants have to think about. And the third round yeah. might be the positional value the Giants need. I, I, we talk about at nauseum, they've needed to address the offensive line. They have done that. 
but it doesn't mean that they need they can't do more. And I still think there are enough question marks where investing at least a third or a fourth round pick in a guard or or in a swing tackle is probably something that Joe Shane has to think about. Yeah, so it, it, I I find this fascinating. By the way, by draft buzz standard, Max Melton is the 76th overall prospect. Why not just wait and take him there? This is that threading of the needle of, yeah, 76th doesn't mean he won't go 65th, right? Doesn't mean you might miss out on a player five picks before you get there. Likewise, at 47, it's the same principle. Hey, if we miss Lassiter, who's the next guy that we like who's maybe ranked 57, 58, right? Like that, we talked about that thing last year during the draft. The window is kind of 10 to 15, you know, 15 pick window one way or the other, if you believe in the prospects that you're talking about. So some of this is going to, because as you mentioned earlier, because you traded away a pick and getting burns and that's fine. The one you got back from Leonard Williams, you do turn around and say, we don't have as much flexibility as we once did. There are a couple of really interesting things that we'll talk about next time that we come back in. It's going to be extending into the fourth and fifth round. Now that we, if we're, if we're going to go corner and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at an offensive lineman or a running back, what happens next for this team? So we'll continue to build out our board. But I find it fascinating to think about a player like Darius Slayton, who we both love. But if you get yourself into a position where you can maybe acquire more draft capital and also deoccupy seven million dollars on the cap it's around seven million dollars i i wonder how that unfolds the rest of this draft i love darius slayton but he doesn't fit the timeline that is being built here right now and i can see a world where the giants try to manufacture another piece for this team by letting go of a low two high three wide receiver and start to really move into the new era roma dunze Jalen Hyatt, Wandale Robinson, and say the youth movement is upon us here. It is. It is an interesting thought, Adam. It, it's Thank a tough you. one because I think his production is exact. It fits perfectly with exactly it's, what I he's know. being paid. Like everything works out, but that also makes him valuable to other teams. And if the Giants are going to pick up uh, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, or Marvin Harrison Jr. early in the round, you kind of have made that position slightly a little bit redundant, where you could get value and maybe get someone else in the fourth round. To your point, if you could get a fourth or a fifth round pick for Darius Slayton, move that money off and draft another tight end as insurance for Darren Waller, maybe that's a better right. allocation of funds. For me, I look at I look at it very simply. If we walk away with someone like Roma Dunze at six, we get uh, Lassiter in the second round, and then we look at getting someone like Jalen Wright, you have instantly improved the explosiveness of your offense with, with yeah, Wright yeah, and yeah. Adunze, no matter what else you decide to do. And if you're able to fill that cornerback spot alongside Deontay Banks, to me, I kind of look around and say, there are other areas we can improve, but I wouldn't sit here and say any of them are like the glaring hole that we have going into the draft. No, 100%. And it's a really good point. Hey, listen, let's get the weapons on both sides of the ball and we'll get these pieces to fit in. Next time that we come back, we'll talk about is this the perfect path? What's the likelihood of these players being available? Obviously, as well. All of that and so much more will be here for you on OGP. So what do you do? You get over to YouTube, One Giant Podcast. You get over on X at Andy Mac 214 at Adam Arbrecht, at One Giant Podcast, wherever you get your podcast needs fulfilled. We promised you big news at the end of last week. That big news is upon us. We'll go ahead and break that down for you on Wednesday as well. And until next time, until the best times, as Andrew Mackowitz would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.